And we're going to dive into the story of Joseph. Now, I can't do it justice in 30 minutes, just so you know. So I'm breaking it into three parts. Um, the, the cool thing for you is this morning is short. <laughs> um, this morning we'll begin the journey in the life of Joseph. But there's there could be 20 sermons in, in the story of Joseph. It's, it's a good portion of the book of Genesis. It starts in Genesis 37, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 37. And I've titled this, A Portrait of Redemption from a Messed Up Family. And you'll see what I mean when we dive into the passage. Um, and I'll let you know that um, as we walk through this, we're going to have to stop at some point. So just trust me that next week we'll continue on as we get to the end of this section. Uh, because if we dive too deep, then I'll take too long, and then you won't be able to eat lunch. So the first we'll focus on this morning is to establish what I'll say the dysfunctional family unit, as well as the realities and reactions to Joseph's dreams. And we all have, you know, seen the Joseph and the Technicolor Dream Code, and and you know, we there's been shows and plays and movies made about it. Um, but what is it really about? And why is it in Scripture? Why do we need to learn about it this morning? So let's read the first section of the story just to get a bit of context of where we're going. And it's Genesis 37. I'll read the first four verses, and then we'll dive into some of the other verses shortly. And it says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more, and all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And I'm going to stop there because uh, it's already kind of weird, right? right. <laughs> and as terrible as it is to see this, Israel and or Jacob, and those names are inter, intermixed, Jacob is given name and Israel, who, what God called him, um, loved Joseph more than all his children. And Jacob, or Israel, was the father of a severely troubled family. I'm just putting it out there. Uh, with sons from four different mothers, all living and working together, so there was a lot of rivalry and competition. Yet, Jacob had a clear favorite, Joseph, who was the son of his old age. And we all have ideas and dreams about what a perfect family is supposed to be. Uh, and by anyone's measure, this was nowhere close to one. Actually, quite the opposite. And as a young man, his father Jacob tried to trick his grandfather Isaac into giving him the family fortune instead of his older brother. And it all fell apart, and Joseph's father Jacob had to run for his life. So this is the pre-story. He had to run for his life when his twin brother vowed to murder him. So Jacob went away more than 200 miles on foot. So he went out of there. He didn't see his father Isaac for more than 20 years when Isaac was almost dead. There's no record that he ever saw his mother again. And Jacob found a place where his mother's relatives, uh, with his mother's relatives, but his uncle cheated him and treated him like a slave. And again, I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase because this isn't the storyline we're focused on this morning. And this, as if that wasn't enough, it was already dysfunctional. Jacob married two of his cousins and took two more concubines, which, concubines, which were like legal mistresses back in the day. Um, so it's even getting more dramatic. Uh, and between them all, they had 12 sons and one daughter. So there was a constant competition and conflict among all the children and all the mothers. Can you imagine? We could do a deep dive just on that whole family dynamic, but I'm not going to. Um, it had turned into one great, big, messed up family. And yet through it all, and this is what we'll, we'll have to keep in the back of our minds, God had a plan and through it brought forth Joseph and furthered God's plan for redemption. So one important parallel that comes out of the knowledge of Joseph's troubled upbringing, if you think about it, it's, it's a portrait of uh, pain, suffering, strife, struggle, uh, disjointedness, 
But there is a parallel here, and, and we'll see it in, in other sermons, the parallel to Jesus' life. And there are parallels that you can make to Jesus' family upbringing in his life. And it seems that God's word to everyone is that, so this is a message to us, that your messed up family, your past, your present, or even your future, does not mean God has forsaken you, or that some cloud has come over your life, that you're so far gone that God can't redeem it. God works in and through difficult and even messed up families, and we'll see that. So diving back into the story, Joseph brought a bad report of his brothers to his father. And this naturally made him even more unpopular and disliked among his brothers. I mean, can you imagine? Um, you're already the favorite, and then you're just saying bad things about your brothers all the time. And this naturally made him even more unpopular and disliked among his brothers. Because who likes a tattletale, right? Who, who likes people, um, like, when you know somebody's going to say something as soon as you do something wrong? And it actually seems kind of juvenile if you think about it. Like, why in the world is God telling us this? And then you take a step back and go, what an idiot. You know, like, don't you see this? And sometimes people ask, um, should Joseph have even brought this bad report? Uh, does he really, in some way, get what he deserves because of being a tattletale? Or what they call a braggart. Um, bragging about how good you are and how bad they are. Uh, or just taunting his brothers. Well, it seems rather that what this story is really showing us is not that Joseph is a tattletale, although that you could surmise that on surface level, um, but that he's faithful. So if you, if you look at what's happening, and you look, because we have the benefit of scripture, and we can look ahead, you can look back and think, he's actually being faithful. He tells the truth. It may be awkward truth. It may be ridiculous the way he does it, the way we perceive it, but he's actually telling the truth, even and especially when the truth will be something that he knows will harm him. Because was he that naive that he didn't think that this was going to come back on him in some way? You know, you got how many brothers that could come against you? So it's interesting that God puts scripture, puts this in scripture this way for us to learn. And this truth for which Joseph's brothers will want to shoot the Lord's messengers. Whereas Joseph is a faith, faithful witness. So Joseph's first responsibility was to his father. So if you think of his role, he's feeling like he needs to report back to his father because that's his job. That's his one job, is to do that. Not to protect or cover over the evil of his brothers. And his brothers were behaving badly. Uh, so to bring this evil report to their father even when they will suffer much for it, shows the uprightness of Joseph's character. It does not necessarily portray him, portray him as a tattletale, although humanly, we will automatically go to that extreme to say, come on, really? Why would you have to say that? Even though they're being bad, why would you even have to say that? That's our natural human response. But it's interesting that Joseph went ahead and, and did these things and said these things. And on the surface level, again, we'd like to judge Joseph. But in hindsight, with God's eyes, there's a deeper meaning behind it. And it may be important to note now that there's a play on words here that has to do with the word pastoring. So if we go back into, into the scripture itself and we look at the words, um, and this is sort of the theologian thought in my head, is what does this mean? What do the words actually mean? And another word for this would be shepherding. So pastoring is shepherding which is what Joseph's out doing. We read here that Joseph was shepherding the flock with his brothers. And this may be digging into the details a bit, but the exact word order is important right out of the gate with Joseph. So if you look at the passage, the Hebrew word, the word order is actually shepherding with his brothers the flock. And the reason it's important is because this exact phrase could actually in the Hebrew be translated in two different ways. It could be shepherding with his brothers the flock, or that word with could actually identify whom Joseph is shepherding. So if you picture Joseph out, goes later on, is taking care of the flock, but it's his brothers out there. So if you think of it, um, the Hebrew word actually could be translated a second way, as Joseph was shepherding his brothers 
the flock. I'll say it again. Joseph was shepherding his brothers, the flock. So if you think of it, although, yes, they are shepherding in the fields with animals, but they're actually um, trying to pull sheaves of wheat. But the wording in the Hebrew is focused on the shepherding part, and Joseph is out overseeing. So I, I found that interesting. Um, in Hebrew, th this word to shepherd or shepherd over people means to reign or to rule over people. And that doesn't mean I'm saying that us as under shepherds in the church have superiority over you. It's actually quite the opposite. To be an under shepherd means that we serve under the great shepherd in caring for your soul. That's a huge responsibility. So in the context of this, it's saying that he is, he's got a responsibility to shepherd. And that seems to be the role that God's preparing him for. So in Hebrew, this word shepherd is to shepherd over the people. And the Lord says to King David in 2 Samuel 5, 2, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel. So what does that mean? It means the Lord is, he continues to clarify actually in the same passage, you shall be prince over Israel. So there's similar terminologies here that suggest that in the future, in 2 Samuel, it's referring back to the same type of role that Joseph has to fulfill. So you shall be prince over Israel, is to shepherd over a people and reign and rule over them as a ruler and as a prince. So immediately we're seeing this hint that Joseph will not only be a ruler over his brothers later in the story, and that's what we'll get to in the third um, part of this, but that um, he is already starting to take on this role, looking back even earlier. So this is sort of a first clue, and we get a very different first clue about Joseph's brothers as well. So I think it's interesting to take note of how intentional scripture can be at portraying this. So we're hearing about the future of how things will be, and it's already described here. I never really thought about that before, that God has already prepared not only who he is, but also what he's going to accomplish. But saying that, however, back in this narrative here, um, this was exasperated by the fact that his father's favoritism had reached, I'll call awkward and extreme levels, to the point that he made a tunic of many colors just for Joseph. Now just picture that. Can you imagine sitting around the supper table with all of your siblings, and there's Joe coming through the door with the best outfit, treated like a king, treated like royalty, just for Joseph. So Jacob's favoritism of Joseph was plain to everyone, including Joseph himself. He had to know, unless he was the most naive person in the world, which I'm not, I don't think so, um, judging from his character. Uh, this was used awkwardly as an outward display of his favor. So what did that mean, right? It signified a position of favor and a princely standing, which goes back to that signal passage. It was a dramatic way of saying he was the son to receive the birthright. He was the favored one. And according to one commentary writer, the real idea behind the ancient Hebrew phrase, so this is the phrase tunic of many colors, is that it was a tunic extending all the way down to his wrists and to his ankles as opposed to a shorter one. So if you're a worker, you have to roll your sleeves up because you're working, you don't want to get them dirty. In this case, that wasn't the case. Joseph would have had it all the way down. And so this was a a um, working man's, working men wouldn't have worn this, is what I'm trying to say. It was a garment of privilege, of status. And the man who wore a tunic of many colors watched others as they did work. So he would have been like a supervisor today. He didn't get his hands dirty. Or as they say, you have soft hands. If you ever want to find out if somebody works hard for a living, you check their hands, right? So in this case, Joseph would have had what we call soft hands. And the passage says they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. And I can imagine what they would have said that they didn't record in scripture. And that's just my thinking. <laughs> you know, apply it to this. I can only imagine with that many brothers, and he's not doing any hard, hard labor or any physical work, comes out of nowhere and starts barking orders and saying to the big cheese how bad you're being. 
I'm, I'm surprised he lasted this long. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. God protected him. Jacob's favoritism of Joseph was an obvious source of conflict, you know, as I've established in the family. And the brothers naturally hated him because the father favored him and Joseph told on them for every wrong they did. Now, even setting the stage this way, we think to ourselves that this, is a, this was bad enough. Okay, so we have a bad situation here. Going through life as a favorite child who was allowed to avoid work, can dress and be treated like royalty, was always made it his mission to report back all the bad behavior. So that's bad enough, right? Well, it gets worse, <laughs> much worse. Joseph starts to dream. And it's amazing for him and bad for them. Go figure, right? So it goes from he's treated awesome to now he's telling everybody how awesome he's taken care of and how badly they will be. So naturally, what does he do? He tells everybody. I can't even imagine what that would have been like. So you already know that you're in the bad books. And then you tell everybody, and by the way, you're you're going to listen to me now because I have something important to tell you. And let's look at it. It's verses 5 to 8 in chapter 37. So this is the first dream. It says, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Go figure, right? He said to them, Hear this dream that I had dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Let's pause there for a moment. So at best, Joseph showed a great lack of tact, you know, humanly speaking, when we read this passage. He must have known how much his brothers hated to hear this dream. I mean, he must have known that they hated him, period. But to hear this dream? And then, of course, that set him above his brothers. He was hated to begin with. Uh, and also sharing the dream, knowing how specific and precise it threw their work in their face. That's what I just couldn't believe when I was reading through this. It, it was specifically about the thing that they do. So, so laser beam focused on them learning that this is about them and it's about what they do. And considering their job was to gather grain at, at harvest, wheat stocks would have been successful for Joseph. And remember, Joseph's the one who didn't do any work, right? right. At least that work. Um, and not for his brothers when they're the ones doing the work. So who does he think he is? I mean, that's what I'd be thinking. Then he makes matters even worse. And he shares not one dream, but a second dream. <laughs> so dream two is verse nine. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, okay, I'll pause there. It actually says that his father was in earshot of this, right? So this is Jacob. Um, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. So brothers understood perfectly the meaning. Of course, this was plain to see. He didn't mince words. One day Joseph would reign over them and have dominion over them. Now, I'm surprised that he's still alive, you know, at this point. I can't imagine saying that. And if, if we were watching, you know, the chosen version of this, watching it on TV, I can only imagine the scuffle that would have ensued when Joseph dared to say these words. And Joseph's ultimate position of status over his family and be connected to grain and food would come in the future. It's funny to think that, right? His ultimate position and status in the future would be about the supply of food and grain and protection of his family. But at this moment in time, the dream involved being over everything that his brothers did and also over his parents. That's a bit of a terrifying statement. And if Joseph was unwise to tell the first dream, 
knowing how irritated it was to his brothers, then it was worse to share the second dream. And the second dream was likely to cause even more resentment because it set him not only above, like I said, his brothers, but his father and mother. And he was either the most naive person in all of scripture or the most resolved and convinced that this would come to pass. So if you have a dream so vivid that you just can't shake it, and that God is saying something so specific that you would go to the lengths to say, I'm going to stand in front of all my other 11 brothers and sister and say this was bold. And then to say it in your shot of Jacob or Israel, um, that is incredibly bold and death defying, if I can use that term, uh, if you think about it. So Joseph potentially suffered from you know, humanly speaking, a sort of pride because things came easily to him. He was well taken care of. He had the best clothes. He didn't have to do the hard work. He ate food without, without having to put labor into it. He was so focused on how great his dreams were for him that he didn't maybe consider how the dreams would sound in the ears of others. And I was thinking about that. Have you ever had a time when things were just going awesome for you? And you just had to tell everybody. And you were constantly telling everybody the same story. And you know, you might embellish it depending on who you're talking to or your family or your friends. And but you just couldn't stop. It was just so amazing to the point where people were like, come on, okay, I get it. It's great. Good for you, right? I was thinking, what would his brothers be thinking? Like, what be for you? Who cares? You know, so you're gonna rule the world, I'm like whatever, go do your thing. I mean, I can only imagine what his brothers were responding with. So, if you think about it humanly, I look at this as maybe there's a discernment that comes from recognizing people's body language, and maybe Joseph didn't have it here, and maybe using wisdom and restraint, uh, once you realize the body language of people, he may have been able to hold back, but it's funny how it's here for a reason. So. When we, we take a step back knowing the full narrative, we can understand why. But in that moment, I'm telling you humanly, I would want to smack him. <laughs> it would drive me crazy if my brother kept saying how amazing everything is, but only for him, right? So anyways, usually Joseph's life can be compared in a lot of ways, like I mentioned, to Jesus. And as we progress through the story, we'll see that. But at this point, this is where we can sense that Joseph may be actually acting in a stark contrast to Jesus, because we wouldn't see this prideful arrogance in Jesus, right? So oftentimes we look at, and we want to automatically parallel every aspect of Joseph's life to Jesus and say how amazing Joseph was. But in this moment, we have to take stock and realize that not everybody was, was perfect like Jesus. Joseph had some flaws. And maybe his overzealousness for truth just didn't come across well. And it was dangerously bad for him. So maybe this is an intentional and parallel lesson that we need to receive about the life of Joseph. Jesus wants us to have, to be the way he was on earth, right? So he wants to be an others-oriented or others-centered person. And Joseph seems to have fallen short in this area because he definitely wasn't an others-focused person at this moment. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, and interestingly, although Joseph was wrong to tell these dreams, the interesting thing is it did come true. So we can look back and go, wow, okay, well, God was obviously setting the stage. And Joseph showed a lack of wisdom here, perhaps rooted in pride, but sometimes God does speak to us in unique and interesting ways. But if I don't believe it needs to be public or extravagant to be of him. So sometimes... God wants to speak to us maybe in subtle ways, maybe in our own life, and maybe it doesn't have to be, have grandeur. It doesn't have to be uh, grandstanded to everybody. You know, I even think of my own life. The fact that I'm standing here right now is a miracle. Amen. You know, if, if you know my history, you know, the end of October, early November, I couldn't walk. I couldn't stand. I couldn't do anything. And... Um, you know, I took some medicine to dull the pain, and I stayed, you know, flat in the bed and did what I was supposed to do. But God redeemed it, and without surgery, my doctor said, I'm not going to call it an immediate miracle, but it was kind of a miracle. <laughs> now, my doctor's a Christian, but even he said, 
I don't want to go over the top here, Dan, but I'm gonna tell you, the fact that you're going off meds and you're not having to see the neurosurgeon yet and you're walking and talking and driving is a miracle. So treat it as, as that. So I'm very thankful and grateful that, again, when I look at these circumstances, I'm reminded of my own circumstances. So, and again, that goes back to our, our focus on prayer and fasting. Sometimes we need to take stock and realize, wow, the blessings. Walking is such a blessing. You know, and, and eating food and having a home and having family. Um, so take stock, and that's the purpose of prayer and fasting, to take stock, to listen, and to wait. We don't like to wait as Christians. We're like, okay, well, God has a plan. Show it to me, right? And we'll see later how Jesus, or how Joseph, sorry, had to wait. There was a lot of waiting in the storyline. But I'm getting off track. Um, back into the context of the story here. Jacob says, Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? So at this point, even Jacob was a bit offended. He couldn't understand how Joseph could be exalted higher than his own father and mother. This was a huge sign of disrespect under normal circumstances if my sons came to me and said, Dad, you know what? It's time to get out of the way. I'm taking over the family. Like, picture in your own home, right? The sons say, I think we got it from here. You don't need to be dad anymore. We're taking over. There would be a battle. I'm just telling you right now, in my home, there would be a battle. Now, I will say, sometimes there are circumstances where you ask people to step in and take care of things. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about, like, hostile takeover. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. And, and this is a side note, but I want to make you aware of it. If you get confused in these chapters of Genesis, um, theologians have noted that this portion of Genesis possibly isn't in chronological order. So if you look back in Genesis 35, it's the um, Joseph's mother, Rachel, died. So this is two chapters ago. I thought it was important to note that. Uh, this portion of Genesis seems to backtrack. Um, I don't think scripture's wrong. I think it's out of order in a sense because there's a transition point in Genesis 37, the second verse I read this morning, which says these are the generations of Jacob. It's almost a finality to it. Like he stopped there. So there was a time when Jacob was probably had his record and then Joseph picks up the record and the next line begins with the record preserved by Joseph himself. So these same kinds of transitions you'll see are found in Genesis 5, Genesis 6, Genesis 25, where the passage of Scripture itself um, seems to wobble, but it doesn't mean it's wobbling. It just means that the record of her dying was recorded in a different set of manuscripts. And this was set aside together by Joseph so that that story made sense. So there's a bit of time overlap here because she's still around for Joseph, right? So I just wanted to make note of that, that the commentary writers all say, don't forget to tell people they're not wrong, right? So I'm letting you know. <laughs> um, but back to the second dream, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And the idea of the stars, the moon, and the sun are representing the family of Israel. And it's actually repeated in Revelation 12:1. Uh, that passage, it speaks of the Jesus coming from, for the nation of Israel, or sorry, from the nation of Israel. So we're looking at the lineage. Uh, it says, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So that's looking back to Jacob, or Israel, and the 12 tribes of Israel and his family. Um, so there is a foreshadowing, and, and we can see looking back in the book of Revelation. Uh, and the second dream is the most profound, but it's Jacob's reaction, though, that's the focal point. And that's sort of where I wanted to land this morning before we get into the next phase next week. Um, the first comes in the rebuking. So his gut reaction is his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? He wants to fight against this. Because that's just what you do as the father. You're in charge here, and all of a sudden, the narrative is flipped. But this will come to pass. So it's interesting that the focal point of the passage, where all of this is going in this section, 
lands on verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him, but, underline but, his father kept the saying in mind. And I think that's very profound in this passage. So Jacob at first rebukes Joseph, sort of giving us a portrait of what a father really should do, naturally. Um, but then he keeps the saying in mind and actually does not dismiss it altogether. His brothers, I'm sure, dismissed it right away. But Jacob still held in his heart. He was mad, frustrated, confused, but aware. And that's the way I would, I would say if I was him and I was godly, I was looking to the Lord, I'd be saying, what does the Lord have for me in this? So if we take a step back then, Jacob takes the hard words from the Lord, and his first reaction, of course, is to rebuke. But then he says, wait a minute, am I being offended just because the word of God is stepping on the toes of my pride? So with, with godly wisdom, he's applying this as potential truth. Why is this so deliberately being said in my family, to me? What does the Lord have for me? So he begins to think, to see if this is really true. And we've already reached the end of the line here in the first passage or section. Um, so the story is giving us the background of the hatred against Joseph uh, that would lead him to be sold into slavery, which we'll talk about next week which will have him end up in Egypt, and we'll tackle that section next week. Um, but how should we apply these first 11 verses? So if we just take this section, and it's just three points, a three-point Baptist sermon, I don't know. Uh, it's just the way my brain works. And uh, number one is to check your heart's reactions to the Word of God. That's challenge number one. Check your heart's reactions to the Word of God. In verse 4, we read about this hatred of Joseph's brothers when they saw that their father loved him more than all other brothers. So they hated him. And this kind of phrase appears throughout the whole Old Testament, especially in Genesis. And it starts in the very beginning in chapter 1. And God saw that creation and said that it was good. So God was evaluating what he saw. However, Eve sinned when she saw the forbidden fruit was good for food. She was making her own sinful evaluation. Those are responses and judgments and evaluation of what we've seen. And the responses represent, uh, we, we would use the term affections. So our affections are like our emotions, but it's not just what we feel. The affections are what we experience. It, but it's not just what we experience as well. They're actually gut reactions that drive us in a certain direction. And they're what I'll call motivating emotions. So if we call it, talk about our affections, um, Jesus used that term about our affection. What are we giving our affections to? Are we focused on self or are we focused on others? Um, God created and gave us these affections with the purpose of leading us toward him. So he created our love, our desire, our rejoicing to drive us to find our joy and satisfaction in him. And at the same time, it's God who created our hatred and our disgust and our fear and our anger. And no, I don't mean God's created us to sin. I mean, God created us to not hate people because it's a sin, but to hate sin. So it's very, we have to be very careful when we use the term hate. I'm talking about the hatred of the sin, not of the people. Um, and sin itself and to be driven away from it. So our affections are to be closer to him and to be farther away from those that will draw us from him so that we can stay close and focused on God. And the problem, of course, is that sin has entered the world and twisted our affections that we feel in our soul. So, of course, our gut reaction is to love what's evil and to hate what's good. And that's the world that we live in right now. It's so easy to love what's evil because it's enticing and to hate what's good because that takes work and it's hard sometimes. But God gave us these affections to lead us to him. But our sin twists them, which is why we need a redeemer in Jesus. And we're responsible for our affections as well. To love what is evil or to hate what is good is already true in sin, even when we don't act on it. So it's interesting that all we have to do is 
is revel in our sin, in our minds and in our hearts, and we're already sinning. We don't even have to do the action of it. We don't have to act on it. Even when we just see it against someone in our heart, and that's a hard one to take, we're already guilty even before we do anything. And of course our affections don't often stay bottled up inside. Even for the brothers of Joseph, they didn't just hate him, they also, and it says in the passage, could not speak peaceably to him. <laughs> that says a lot, right? Their speech became violent towards him. And uh, your heart's reaction can tell you a lot about what's going on in your soul. So Joseph already knew that their hearts were wicked because I'm sure he heard a lot from them. And the world tells you just follow your heart. Your heart will lead you. I know you have a good heart. You know, that's what the world will tell us. And, you know, the quotes on social media, just follow your heart and your dreams will come true. That's sort of a worldly perspective on things. But the Bible warns us of the contrary. And scripture actually says the heart is in fact deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can know it? We can't comprehend a true, solid, biblical heart without Jesus Christ. We need him to redeem our heart because we are desperately wicked. And the brothers didn't really know why they were hating the faithfulness of the brother, but it was just because of their sin. So this is a warning to us, I think, if we look at this passage, that the brothers are the warning to us um, that we have to get our affections right. Our minds need to discern, are my affections or the gut reactions that I have in my soul in line with God in his word or just my own selfish desires? We need to check our heart's reactions and then, of course, repent from them and resist them if they're going to be godly. And then point number two, keep the Lord's word in mind. Keep the Lord's word in mind. And again, Jacob is a great example here of how we should respond. Our first reaction may not be totally in line with the word of God, but Jacob kept the saying in mind. So there is wisdom there. And if you abandon yourself to whatever you're feeling at the moment, then what's going to happen is that your desires, or as I've said, your affections are going to start to work on your mind. And our minds are so good at being able to be twisted for the justification of whatever we want to justify in our lives. And we've seen examples of that all through our lives where we can turn something if we want it to be in our favor by manipulating situations so that it goes better for us, even to the detriment of others. So is our focus on wanting the best for someone else or is the focus always about me? So as a church, if our only goal is for personal gain and satisfaction, we're not going to go anywhere. We, if we're going to grow, it has to be an others-focused mindset. And I think this is an example here. Um, and it's easy to justify what's evil and to condemn what's good, which is what the brothers were trying to do. And the Bible teaches us that our negative affections are something that we should repent of, um, something that certainly we should resist. And our, our negative affections are always something that can can be changed, but it can only be changed by God's grace. I can't resolve as a human being to say, I'm going to be better today, and then just expect it to happen. I have to say, I'm going to be better because I have Jesus. And because I have Jesus, today will be better. And even if it isn't, I know Jesus is going to walk me through it. And that's the difference about transforming and the renewing of our minds. In Romans 12, 2, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How are we transformed by the renewal of our minds? That's where it starts. And then the last point, you guys can come on up. The last point is to be faithful to the Lord's word. So to be faithful to the Lord's word. Joseph must suffer for his faithfulness to the word of God. One after another, as we look to the, the narrative that's coming ahead in the next couple weeks, we'll learn about the many ways in which Joseph must suffer for his faithfulness to the word of God. And Joseph, as an example of what it means to be meek and humble, patient and faithful, even when our culture grows increasingly hostile towards the word of God and towards Christianity. So the question we have to ask is, 
when the decision comes to suffer for faithfulness to Jesus, will we be ready? Will we comprehend or understand what our next step is supposed to be? Or better, when the many decisions arise now in our lives to suffer in small ways, small ways of suffering for faithfulness to Jesus, are we ready? So that could be the smallest little thing like offering to drive somebody to church. Or it could be to not be fearful in the lineup and ask people how their day's going and actually listen for the answer and expect people to tell you that they had a bad week and then we can offer to pray for them. Um, some people would look at that as suffering because they're introverts maybe. <laughs> you have to get out of our shell. And others, it's an opportunity. And um, if we're gonna be a church that loves our community, it's gonna have to get a little bit messy. And uh, this, this passage is an example of awkwardness and faithfulness all wrapped up in one. And it's a lesson we all need to learn that sometimes we have to break out of the normal, break out of the comfort. We love to be comfortable here in PEI. Um, but people are coming, new cultures, new families. Um, freedom is waning. We don't understand really what freedom is until we lose it. So are we ready for that, I'll call low level persecution when it's hard to be a Christian in our culture? So we need that challenge in our lives. And the only person that's going to guide us is Jesus. So that's my focus. Let's pray.